Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. On behalf of the entire CompuMed team, welcome to another presentation in our management webinar series. The topic today, kidney pathology, has been our most requested subject matter from all of the surveys we get from all of you. So we do listen, and here we are to present this. So just want to emphasize that the polls and the surveys that you all complete for us are really valuable as we continue to explore different topics to present to all of you. So today, we are really thrilled to have Dr. Mohammed al Haig to share his expert insight about kidney pathology and the importance of having a renal pathology specialist reading the studies. Dr. Hal Haig is certified pathologist with extensive experience in pathology. As you read in all the invites, he's highly published and very passionate about this topic. So I'm just going to let him take it away. Thanks, Dr. Al Haig. We're excited. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. And let me share my screen here. Let me just go back and again, you know, greetings everybody. And thank you for joining us today for this talk on kidney transplantation pathologist. My name is Mohammed El Haq. I'm a practicing pathologist with training and experience in transplantation pathologist. If any of you are from the Pittsburgh area, they probably know me. If any of you are from Coro or were from Coro, probably interacted at some level before. What we do when I was in Pittsburgh, we used to do high volume kidney transplantation donor evaluation, and we use digital technology as well as other technologies and methods for evaluating kidney, liver, as well as other biopsies from potential organ donors. So the primary objective from today's talk is really to discuss the role of pathology in the world of organ procurement. I have something here that popped up, so I'm just going to move it a little bit. Uh, in the world of organ procurement, organ allocation, and also post-procurement as well. So there is a role for pathology and kidney biopsies and kidney sampling in these environments as well. We'll also discuss some of the challenges that face us as pathologists, OPOs, as coordinators, and, and companies like CompuMed who are trying to provide a solution for these. We'll also touch briefly on the history of transplantation, challenges of doing things online, right? So I'm also going to touch briefly on the history of transplantation. It's more interesting than, you know, usually we might think. We'll discuss a little bit about the usual things that are common that we see in kidney biopsies, what the problems are, what the pitfalls are, what mistakes can happen, with, what discrepancies happen. And then we'll talk a little bit about reproducibility and prognostication, things that kind of might plague a little bit donor biopsy evaluation in the kidney and in the liver as well. All right, so let's go in here. So organ transplantation is actually way older than we, we think it is. It could goes back maybe millennia. Some of the earliest and most interesting accounts, possible myths about organ transplantation go back to 1600 BC, where skin autologous, autogenous skin grafts were talked about, right? But the most, or the first thing that, that is from one human to the other human was a leg transplantation performed by Kuzma and Demian, who were both Syrian-born physicians and surgeons who were well-known, who are sainted physicians and are well-known for treating their patients for free. Now they're immortalized with this beautiful basilica in Rome. I think in, it's around the Vestabian Forum in Rome. It's a beautiful place to go and see. Their work is also immortalized in a lot of things and beautiful depictions throughout Italy as well as in the Middle East. So Cosma and Demian are known, or the myth goes, that they have transplanted an Ethiopian leg into one of their patients, and it worked, right, because they were sending physicians. Now, more scientific, recent scientific era, however, relied heavily on animal studies, right? The cornerstone of transplantation is the vascular mastomosis, and I'm not mistaken, the people who developed this, or the person who has developed this, has actually won the Nobel Prize. This is truly a huge landmark in organ transplantation. That is all followed by a lot of xenotransplantation experiments of taking one organ from one animal to another animal, from an animal to a human. Xenotransplantation has, of course, failed throughout and continues to be a challenge to perform. Our most recent, I think, well-documented is a heart that has been beating for around a month, I think, in the University of Maryland, and that was xenotransplantation. 
but after a month that heart has failed. So we're still not successful with that. So we only rely now on human to human transplantation, as well as of course, there is a future for artificial organs. The first human to human transplantation in the modern era has been performed by Dr. Voronai in Russia. And that was a deceased kidney donor from one deceased kidney donor into a recipient. Now this was done across ABO barriers. And at the time, I don't think they had a full grasp of the immunology underlying successful transplantation. Of course, that transplantation procedure has failed. The first successful transplantation was a kidney. And that was done in around 1954 in Boston by Dr. Joe Morey, who passed away about 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. So what he did was he took a, a, a living donor a twin, an identical twin, and transplanted the kidney from one identical twin to the other. Of course, there are no immunological barriers to this procedure. The procedural part of it, the vascular anastomosis, the, the, the surgical parts of the procedures have been perfected for many years. Of course, there's always, there has always been room for more perfection for more difficult procedures, but the surgical part of it has been perfected. And now with identical twins who are very similar genetically, this organ has actually found the function for many, many, many years. Now, this has given us insight that there are mismatches between donors and between recipients that we need to be on the lookout for. Of course, ABO blood grouping is the first barrier to transplantation, but even in this day and age, we have ways across this transplantation in order to increase the, the donor pool and allow the sickest to get organs first. In the 1960s, a giant of a man by the name of Thomas Stasel entered the field. He was one of the few to first describe chemical immune suppression by adding prednisone to his protocols. Prior to that, very aggressive protocols that included all body irradiation, usually of the donors, have been tried. They have failed miserably, of course, in some cases. In others, they have worked, so the descriptions are still there, but prednisone and other forms of chemical immune suppression have been introduced and they have shown success. And he's shown tremendous success in explaining to the world the importance of, of immunology in the world of organ transplantation. And he has been able to fundamentally change the field. He is one of the pioneers of tolerance. Tolerance remains the holy grail of transplantation in which we want organs to be transferred from one recipient to the donor without having to give them immune suppression. Now that he has been able to achieve that from the 90s in very, very select and few patients who remain, some of them remain completely tolerant and some of them remain operational tolerant. He's also among the first, of course, to perform liver transplantation as well as among the leading developers of current tacrolimus and FK506 and cyclosporin medications that we currently use for immune suppression. Of course, since the time of Strazo, a lot of physicians and scientists have worked diligently on the field of organ transplantation for us to reach the current status that we are in right now. We know very well that kidney transplantation truly saves lives. One, it improves the quality of life recipients, those with end-stage liver disease, and two, it improves their survival. One may survive more with a transplant kidney than with dialysis alone. So it offers hope and improved lifestyle as well as hopefully a prolonged survival for these patients. The problem is that the majority of patients with end-stage kidney disease are going to be in a waiting list and they will not receive a kidney. You guys know better than me with the average length of a wait list is for kidney transplantation. The problem that we face now is that the demand far exceeds the supply. So of course, as we always do, human ingenuity, right? We have to get creative. What are we gonna do? We're gonna expand the donor. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna expand we're going to expand criteria, right? So we're going to take what is known as ECD donors or expanded, cri expanded criteria donors. And I will talk a little bit about what that means. We have experimented with hepatitis C virus positive donors. We call these HCV mismatch, in which we take an organ from a hepatitis C virus infected donor and place that in recipient who is HCV negative. So we're able to do that now because we have medications to treat hepatitis C virus infection. Other things that have expanded the donor pool include the use of actually kidneys from COVID positive donors. Thus have actually also been shown to work, but this of course is probably done in a very limited number of 
large volume centers. And unfortunately, despite all of this, the largest contribution to the donor pool has actually come from the opioid epidemic. And that is a very unfortunate thing. Kidney donor profile index is a clinical method for evaluating these donors, right? So you get a donor, you have their age, you have their medical history, you know what is going on with them. So we've developed a kidney donor profile index or a KDBI as a method to evaluate these donors, whether they're ECD donors, whether they're regular donors. And we give them a percentage score. And that percentage score tells us how good an organ might be uh, and how well it may function, right? Now, there are multiple scores and parameters that go into this, and we'll also talk about it. But I want you to know that high KDBI and in the introduction of these expanded criteria donors has probably increased the number of biopsies that we perform because some of these higher KDBI patients will need a biopsy in order to fully investigate their kidney. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. A huge problem in the transplantation world especially in kidney, is the rate of discard. In the United States, our rate of discard is extremely high. It's probably around 40%, right? 38% of those discarded kidneys, organs, are discarded because of results on their pathology reports. So we need to take that into consideration that these pathology reports that we are generating for organ transplantation centers to be able to accept or reject an organ collectively have resulted or contributed significantly to the rejection of about 38% of all discarded kidneys. Now that is a huge number. And as a pathologist, I wanna improve that number and decrease it, right? So organ and donor evaluation, I apologize. So organ and donor evaluation is done at multiple levels, right? At the OPO level, it's done at the, at the centers that are accepting these organs, transplantation centers as well, and it's tailored towards specific patients. So one organ might not be good for patient A, but this organ is probably to improve the lifestyle of patient B, for example. So when we talk about extended criteria, donors or expanded criteria donors, we're talking about individuals who are older than the age of 60, or those are, who are older than the age of 50, but have hypertension, and those with high creatinine, anything over 1.5 milligrams is considered to be an expanded criteria donor, as well as those who die, die from cerebrovascular accident, of course, with very visible and clear reason and is that they have vascular disease that has affected them and actually led to death. So, by proxy, that means that kidneys are probably also might be affected by this vascular disease as well. Now, the KDPI is a very helpful tool that clinicians use to evaluate the donors and their kidneys, right? So that factors in age, height, weight, ethnicity, diabetes, hypertension, creatinine level, history of hepatitis C virus infection, as well as a DCD donor. A DCD donor, as you all know, is donation after circulatory death. Those are less than ideal donors. And those donors also usually are a little bit riskier and their organs are less than ideal because of the ischemia that they have to go through while we wait for them to pass away, unfortunately, as well as the cause of death, things like cerebrovascular accident. Things that are not included in these evaluations, of course, are unfavorable pump parameters, abnormal anatomy, history of malignancy and transmission risk, as well as other, other infectious etiologies. Now, we're not going to talk a lot about malignancy and transmission risk, but those are very clear, right? We have charts. We know which types of cancers. We would never touch the patient. The patient is just not considered a donor. And what type of cancers that we allow a certain time to elapse before we accept them as donors. These are clear. And, we can, and this can be a subject of talk for other presentations as well, if clarity is felt to be needed in these. Now, let's go back to the KDPI system and, and talk about it and how we can use it. Now, KDPI, in the KDPI system, things are sometimes placed in it, but not necessarily the full context. It doesn't reflect the full context. For example, <laughs> I apologize. So I'm having my Marco Rubio moment. So I'm going to have a sip of water. An African-American donor, for example, will have a, 
an increase in the KDPI by 17%, irrespective of other risk factors. Now, what we do with a biopsy, if you take a biopsy of this donor and you look at their kidney, hmm, this guy does not have FSGS. There are no other glomerular regions. So that means if I'm a clinician and I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know what, that's 17%, they did a kidney biopsy and they don't see glomerular regions. Okay, I might take this patient. Then let's look at the other factors. This donor has a history of hepatitis C virus infection, increases my KDPI by up to 23%, irrespective of renal function. As a clinician, I will look at the renal function. I will say, you know what, that's good. It's a good renal function, but that increased my KDPI. Are there any correlates? Hepatitis C virus <laughs> and some of the other viral infections are known to cause renal disease. And that's why hepatitis C virus infection is in the KDPI. But if you do a kidney biopsy and you look at it, I'm not seeing any cryoglobulins. I'm not seeing any other glomerular lesions. I'm not seeing any damage that is associated with hepatitis C virus in the kidney biopsy. Serum creatinine, for example, you have an increased serum creatinine in your donor that increases your KDPI. Now, whether this increase is from a chronic disease or just from acute tubular injury due to the hospitalization and the circumstances surrounding their brain death, for example, we do not know. So you do a kidney biopsy, pathologist might, me looks at it and they said, hmm, you guys have acute tubular injury here. That is reversible versus when I say, Yes, this actually, this guy has chronic renal disease with a high number of sclerosis, glomeruli, and interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. That makes a huge difference as the cause of the increased creatinine, whether it's an acute reversible event or is it chronic irreversible damage to the kidney. Other factors that we can see as well and help in kidney biopsies that are factored into the KDBI include things like diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and other chronic diseases, which we can also see on kidney biopsy. So we can diagnose hypertensive nephropathy, we can diagnose diabetic nephropathy. And I will show you guys some images and how we do this and what that looks on a donor kidney biopsy. Now, <clears throat> biopsies in general, we call them procurement biopsies. They can also be called donor biopsies, but for us, let's call them a procurement biopsies. Roughly 50% of donors will get a kidney biopsy. And with the current OPTN guidelines, which recommend that anyone with a KDPI over 85% gets a biopsy, as well as our expanded criteria donors, many of them will get a biopsy, and that's the recommendation by OPTN. Now, the recommendation also recommends a 10 by 5 millimeter size wedge biopsy. And we'll talk about differences in terms of pathology between wedge biopsy and a core biopsy and which one is better. They're very equivalent. The wedge gives you more information in certain things. The core, is, the core gives you more information in other certain things. I personally love the wedge biopsy. They're harder to read for a pathologist, but it always gives us consistently gives us a decent number of glomeruli that we can look at and allow us to really look at interstitial fibrosis and glomerular and, and tubular atrophy. Now, all of these factors will definitely increase the number of performed apps. So the need is for certain things. One, these are done in non-ideal circumstances, right? Why well, is ideal? You're in time crunch. Everyone wants the results. Everyone wants to place the kidneys, right? You're getting wedge biopsies. Some pathologists might not like them. You're overrepresenting definitely in these wedge biopsies, things like glomerular sclerosis, because maybe your biopsy is something that is scarred. You're doing a frozen section, which is full of artifacts, and is a lot harder to read than a regular pathology section. The quality is just different. There is no question. You show a pathologist a section that's a permanent or a well-processed section versus a frozen section, we'll always be able to tell the difference. We don't even need to look at it under the microscope. We can just look at the slides and we can definitely tell the difference. We're only relying on H &E that is performed manually rather than a one hour process to perform a proper H &E stain, as well as a number of other specialist stains like silver stains, PSs, and trichomes. You're asking a pathologist to read it at the middle of the night, kidney transplantation. You always need somebody at night to read these bi biopsies. Many times it's an uncle all pathologists. Some of them may or may not have a special training in kidney pathologists. They might not even know the, the important parameters to, to be reported in these. 
Of course, those tra trained in kidney pathology are very good at treating these biopsies and will be able to give you consistent, consistent results all the time. <clears throat> now, I want to touch base very quickly about the big differences between a post-perfusion biopsy, which is performed during transplantation, but after the organ is connected to the, to the recipient and after it is perfused with the recipient's blood and between the procurement biopsy, which we do it basically to place the organ. So there is no room, there is no way we can do a post-perfusion biopsy and place the organ, usually it's done after that. But I want you to know the differences. And the differences are big. The procurement biopsies are always wedge biopsies. Most of the time are wedge biopsies. These are the popular type of biopsies and we can suture that area very nicely and neatly, no bleeding. Needle biopsies are performed for post-perfusion biopsy. We freeze our procurement biopsy. We do a single stain. And depending on where it's done and who's reading it, the reporting parameters are very different. There are some centers that will only report a total number of global glomerular sclerosis versus the total number of glomeruli, and they will not report any other. Okay. Of course, there is always the availability of an expert pathologist to review these once they are scanned in through a whole a slide image scanner. But that is also not available everywhere. Post-perfusion biopsies are always read, almost read by exclusively well-trained kidney pathologists, usually kidney renal pathology fellowship training, as well as multiple years of experience in some cases. The reported elements are standardized by BAP. Everybody does the same exact report. So these are very valuable in terms of prognosis of these reperfuse or this just decently perfused organs. Now, let's talk about pathology findings in these biopsies. Let's see what we're looking for as a pathologist, what the images look like, what glomeruli look like, what different compartments look like. So you guys always collect these biopsies. You put them in nice little containers labeled with the patient's name, usually birth date, as well as their UNOS number. It depends, but we at least need to identify us. Do not place them in saline. Feel free to place them in a University of Wisconsin preservative, for example, or any other organ preservative, but not saline, because saline creates a lot of artifacts, which make it very hard to, because we freeze the tissue, makes it very hard to actually evaluate these organs. Now, we use this machine. This is called a cryostat. It freezes the tissue. And then through really fine microtome blades, we're able to cut them, generate slides, that we use a microscope to look at them. Now, there are different compartments that we look at in these. Once a, a slide is made and we're looking at it under the microscope, there are various compartments that we look at. One of them is the glomerular compartment. Two is the vascular compartment. Three is the interstitial compartment. And four is the tubular compartment. Now, I look at the slide at least four times because I look at each compartment separately and maybe a fifth time just to look at everything together. I give you a score for each compartment. I tell you what is going on with each compartment. That is what the BANF has suggested. And we'll go over what the BANF suggests and how we're trying to standardize the reading of these biopsies. Now, each compartment has a set of parameters that we look at. Some of them are very easy to see, some of them are more difficult, and some of them are extremely challenging. Now, this is how that 10 by 5 millimeter biopsy that you guys took from the donor kidney and delivered to us pathology. We section it under the cryostat using a microtome plate, very thin section, usually about four, mil, four microns in thickness. We place it in a glass slide and we stain it with an h &E stain. Now, this is how it looks like on a glass slide, right? It retains the same size. Maybe it expands a little bit because of the freezing, but it's one by five millimeters, 10 millimeters by five millimeters. Now that's a lot of real estate to look at at high power <coughs> because we look at it at around 40 times up to 400 times the original size using a microscope. Now, this is a scanned image, meaning I don't have to sit under a microscope to look at it. I can look at it through a computer screen and drive it as if I'm sitting at a microscope. It's actually much easier 
quicker for a pathologist and I can do it from anywhere. And instead of having to come into the hospital and look at it under my microscope. Now, the glomerular compartment is probably the most important compartment that we need to look at when we're evaluating these donor biopsies. I'll give you a total number of no of glomeruli, whether there is sclerose, they're diseased, or they're healthy. I'll just give you a total number. I count them. This is how a normal glomerulus look like. It has these nice loops of capillaries. These are capillaries through which, through which blood comes in, filtrates, and goes out into the space. And then through the tubules, it would go all the way out and into the blood, and then it comes out. Right? This is how I expect a normal glomerulus to look like. <clears throat> this is another example of a normal glomerulus. A normal glomerulus. Now, granted, this is this appears a little bit cellular. However, again, this is the challenger. I cannot take this out of context, and I cannot do what I do with a post-perfusion biopsy on this biopsy. So, most of the time, unless we have significant disease, we kind of let them go as part of the spectrum of what is normal, as well as in a patient who is undergoing the process of death or brain death. Now, we also count the number of globally sclerotic glomeruli, meaning they go from this and become obsolescent and fibrotic, meaning they're not functional. They're not helping us produce urine. They're not helping us get rid of toxins at all. So they're useless. So we count them, however, because it gives us an idea about how much damage the kidney has sustained. Again, this is the most important parameter. But I don't just, we don't just give you a number of the globally sclerosis glomeruli as a percentage of the total number of glomeruli. We also look for other things, right? This is the easy part. Especially if we have enough glomeruli, this is really the easy part. Now, all pathologists sometimes may ask you, what is the creatinine? What is the age? Do they have hepatitis C? Do they have hepatitis B? How did they die? We ask these questions because we want to cheat a little bit. We want to know what to look for very carefully, right? If you tell me this is a 60-year-old who's African-American, I'm going to be looking very hard for lesions like focal segmental sclerosis. And I'm going to tell you about that because this is going to affect how you place this kidney or if you place this kidney at all. If I know that this is an diabetic patient, I will look for evidence of diabetes in the kidney. If I see things like chemilistine wells in nodules, this is called nodular glomerular sclerosis. If I see that, I will tell you, I will write it in a comment. I do see focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And I will tell you what the differential is. Most clinicians know. And if I see elements of diabetic nephropathy, I'll also tell you. Most of the time when we see KW diabetic lesions or someone with a known history of diabetes and we verify that on the biopsy, most of the time that's not the most perfect biopsy to give to somebody who can afford to wait a little bit longer, who is, who is younger and we can expect to give that kidney for many, many, many years, right? If it's a functioning kidney, I might give it to somebody else in the donor list or it might end up being discarded. <clears throat> Other lesions that we look for are things like glomerular thrombi now, as well as necrosis and other lesions of activity, right? So glomerular thrombi are important because, you know, it, it just, it's occluding these capillaries. So these glomeruli are not functioning at 100%. We, take, we need to take that into consideration. Usually we see that in the context sometimes of head trauma. So if you hear me asking, you, oh, how did this patient die? They have had trauma. That means maybe I'm looking to see if there are thrombi. Usually the cutoff is about 10 to 20%. So anything less than 10 or 20%, usually most of the time we don't, you know, they clear out, that is fine. But once you see it, it's widespread, then, you know, the decision becomes a little bit more difficult because the kidney might not actually work once it's transplanted. Now, this is one of the more challenging things when it comes to glomeruli. The easiest thing in the glomerular compartment is really the count of what is globally sclerosis versus what's not sclerosis. Now, the vascular compartment is also challenging. We give you a score based on the percentage of atherosclerosis involving the most significantly affected artery. So I'm looking for the most significantly affected artery, and I'm scoring it, meaning if it's occluded by only less than 10%, I'm going to call it mild atherosclerosis. If it's more less than 50%, but maybe more than 10%, 25%, maybe I'll call that moderate atherosclerosis. Now, things that are completely occluded or occluded more than 50%, we call those severe atherosclerosis. Now, this is not as easy as it appears because these arteries are tubular structures. And if we cut it this way or this way or tangentially, it will look weird and it will be very hard to tell. 
if this is mild, moderate, or if there is any disease at all. So you need a certain level of expertise in order to figure these weird cut arteries. <clears throat> now, arterial hyalinosis is one of the most difficult things to appreciate on a frozen section, mainly small arterioles entering or leaving the glomeruli. They're very hard to find and locate because again, that you have to get that perfect section in order to see them. And the other thing is that the frozen artifact makes it very hard to see. If I see one arterial with hyaline, that's by definition mild arterial hyalinosis. If I start to see more, I'll get into moderate and severe. Now, these things do not occur in isolation. If I'm seeing severe arterial sclerosis or hyalinosis, that means there is an element of vascular arterial disease as well. So it's probably moderate arterial sclerosis. That also means my, my glomeruli are going to be affected. So all of these things, elements are going to move together. They're going to get severe together. We're going to lose them together, right? So you're not going to find 100% glomeruli, but severe vascular disease, unless the biopsy is not the best, right? Or it's not representing everything. Interstitial compartment, we look for a number of things. One is the interstitial inflammation, but it's not a major determinant of graft function. We'll talk about that. But the most important thing is chronicity, meaning interstitial fibrosis. Now, this is very challenging because in frozen sections, we introduce this space in the interstitial, which can be edema and artifact, which can make it very hard to identify interstitial fibrosis. The other problem with interstitial fibrosis, it's really very overemphasized and presented on which biopsies. Sometimes there are subcapsular scars in kidneys that are otherwise perfectly well and function really well. And if we do a core biopsy and we see deeper, maybe the fibrosis are minimal or non-existent. But when you only look at a scarred area under the capsule, I might tell you it's severe. Remember, I'm not looking at the whole kidney. I'm looking at that one centimeter piece from under the capsule that might actually have been scarred. And that's why it was biopsy because of that little scar. But remember, that little scar may not represent the entire kidney. So when you're biopsying the kidney, you see a scar, you can biopsy just to see what's going on with the scar, but try to biopsy an area that looks healthy. So I can give you something that, because they're not in the entire kidney is scarred, it's only a small area. So I can give you something that represents the entire kidney. I'm not talking about that little area. It might be inconsequential to the kidney function. The other compartment is tubular compartment. Now, there are two things in the tubular compartment. Acute changes and chronic changes. Now, tubular atrophy is a chronic change. It goes hand in hand usually with interstitial fibrosis. Most of the time, we consider them to be the same compartment. In the transport world, we call this IFTA, I for interstitial, F for fibrosis, T is for tubular, A for atrophy. So we call it IFTA. So we refer to them as one thing because they are really related and they go hand in hand. Once you have fibrosis, you're going to have atrophy. Once you have atrophy, you're going to find fibrosis. Now, the other more acute thing that happens there, and pathologists are not the best are telling it at in a frozen section because it's not that specific, and we don't necessarily agree all the time, is tubular injury. Maybe a tubular injury or the sloughing of the tubular epithelium, which again is a reversible phenomenon that will increase your creatinine at the time of death. Maybe that is the only problem with this patient, right? But we know it's reversible. So this is a transplantable kidney. Sometimes it can go from mild, where it's moderate, there is a lot of it, and it's very clear and probably correlates with a more severe elevation of creatinine and loss of kidney function to complete cortical infarction. Now, depending on the amount of cortical infarction, which can be challenging to verify, it might be a little bit hard to place this kidney. But again, remember, if the area on the biopsy is just that area that has been hypoperfused and infarcting, but the rest of the kidney looks healthy, but you biopsy that infarcted area, the results are gonna look bad, right? So maybe again, provide another biopsy from the area that looks healthy. Usually with infarction, however, it's not like that. It's more with, with scarring. The other challenges that we see with evaluation of the frozen section are these artifacts that are being introduced by the frozen section, meaning things, there's actually ice in here, which kind of expands things, which doesn't let me see tubular atrophy very well, doesn't let me see interstitial fibrosis very well, prevents me from scoring the tubular injury very well, right? The other thing that can occur as well are things that can be introduced at coverage limit. Remember, for me to be able to see into the tissue, I need to cover it with something that is transparent, like a piece of glass 
or a piece of plastic that is really transparent. And in between them, we have something called the mounting media. Now, if the cover is sleeping introduces air into this, it will look like this. It will blacken this piece of tissue and it won't be able to see into it very well. I might give you the rest of this, but I won't be able to read this for you, but that's fine. If I can get the decent number of glomeruli on three quarters of the biopsy, that is actually all right. Of course, sometimes the challenge is to get enough glomeruli. Sometimes we get 20 glomeruli. That is not a very common thing to happen, especially when we got those 10 by 5 millimeter biopsies that are subcapsular are really well done. That is not usually the challenge that we face, although it does happen from time to time. <clears throat> now, there's all of this stuff that we have described. Does it act actually correlate with graft function? That is a very good question. Why are we doing it? Basically, for something to be useful clinically, it has to show two things. Prognostic value, meaning is this kidney actually going to work and how well is it going to work and how long is it going to last, right? Two, it has to be reproducible, right? If it's read by me or by another pathologist or by a third pathologist, we have to be able to reproduce these results to, so that we can give the same prognostic value. Now, there is a lot of ambigu ambiguity about the utility sometimes of donor bias, especially when we do a lot of them. But hear me out, in the right setting, by the right people, this can be a very valuable tool, not by itself, but when you consider KDBI and the elements of the KDBI, the elements of your biopsy results, especially if it's read by well-trained pathologists, as well as the other clinical parameters, instead of discarding a kidney based on a KDBI, maybe the biopsy will inform you your decision not to discard. But maybe the biopsy will also tell you, hey, this kidney isn't really good. It needs to be discarded, or maybe it needs to be allocated to somebody else who might take a couple of years out of it, but they're also really sick and they really need it, right? So <clears throat> there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a number of studies out there. The methodologies have been different. The sample sizes have been different and the sampling variability has been. But the most important elements that have always been determinants of prognosis between different various studies has been global glomerular sclerosis as a percentage of the total number of glomeruli, interstitial fibrosis and its brother, tubular atrophy, as well as the presence or lack of the presence of vascular disease. Now, many centers rely only on the global glomerular sclerosis. Other might look at other parameters, there are other centers who have done a very smart thing, which is we're not going to look at global glomerular sclerosis alone. We're not going to look at IFTA alone. We're going to combine them, the three of them, or even show you some really creative examples. Create a score that will give us the sum of all of these chronic parameters is much more helpful than using one. And I'll show you very good examples here. Now, we know very well that these procurement biopsies, the results have been ambiguous, but we'll cl clarify it out in a little bit. But compared to post-perfusion biopsies, which consistently show correlation with how the kidney function. Now we wanna do that as well with procurement biopsy, but we have to do it the same way that we do post-perfusion biopsy, meaning standardization and the people who look at these biopsies, right? That way you will get reproducibility as well as prognostic value. So again, I keep emphasizing this, that the glomerular sclerosis score or the number of glomeruli has been really the most important value that we provide. Uh, usually the cutoff value is 20%, but of course that can be revisited and that can change from one center to the other. You have to remember that these were these cutoffs were developed many, many years ago. And I would remind you that in some of the original studies, the eight cases, the eight biopsies that showed more than 20% and that were transplanted, only three of them lost their kidneys without, within three months. That means those other six patients who might not get these kidneys because there is a greater than 20% glomerular sclerosis, many of these can be transplanted and some of these kidneys can actually benefit. Now, what a nice group did in Spain was, they said, okay, we're not gonna lie, rely on a single parameter, right? We're gonna get all of these parameters. GS means global sclerosis. CI is a chronic interstitial fibrosis. CT is our chronic tubular atrophy as well as our arteriosclerosis, which is referred to as CV, as well as our 
arterial hyaluronosis, we're going to combine them together and we're going to form a score. And based on that score, they were able to lower their discard rate from 11.5% successfully to only 5.5%, right? Now, to start with, Europeans have a lower discard rate for many reasons that, you know, we can discuss later, but they do have a much lower, significantly lower discard rate than we do. But remember, the U.S. is very high volume when it comes to transplantation. We transplant more than many of these other European countries. Now, the BAF working group, and I know we're getting towards the end of our time, so I'm going to just make this very quick. The BAF working group has been working very hard to try and replicate their success in cost perfusion biopsies to procurement biopsies. Now, they have come with donor biopsy scoring sheets, which is basically, I think now many of the OPOs are adopting, and many of the compument OPOs are also adopting, or a variation of these. Basically, the total number of glomeruli, the extent of glomerular sclerosis, as well as the percentage which can be calculated from these, as well as the number of arteries. Now, we need the number of arteries because it gives us an idea about how good these biopsies are, right? This is more of a, you know, is it an optimal biopsy? How good is the biopsy kind of question? The number of arteries will give you that parameter, right? And you'll be able to compare them. Different biopsy results to different biopsy results and figure out what is a good biopsy versus what is a suboptimal biopsy. Now, the other parameters that are being scored, we all talked about, it's things like interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy, interstitial inflammation, which we said is not an important parameter. It doesn't really correlate with graft function, but is important to put in context of the whole organ, right, that we're transplanting. Things that are chronicity, like arterial intimal fibrosis, arterial hyalinosis, as well as necrosis, the number of glomeruli or thrown by, right, glomerular thrombosis. I always comment on presence of other things like chemistibus in nodule. If there's something that looks like a small tumor, I need to let you know if I see it. Things like focus segmental sclerosis. Now, the BAMF group since 2010 has met multiple times, right? They've done a beautiful study that is published out in the American Journal of Transplantation in 2017. And in addition to providing us with this, they gave us context. They told us how reproducible the results are, right? Now, this study was done using only experienced and well-trained transplantation or kidney transplantation pathologists. Now, the things, let's talk about this graph on the left side. So basically here, we're comparing the inter correlation between different pathologists to biopsies that were read through frozen section and paraffin tissue. Right. So paraffin tissue will always, paraffin means it has gone through the regular processing. We have gotten rid of different artifacts. This is your classic way of doing pathology, which it probably takes many, many hours for us to be able to generate a slide to read. We do not have that luxury in the transplantation world, so we have to do the frozen section. Now, what is relevant to us here is are the bars in green, which are based on frozen section. You can see that we're very good at getting a consistent count glomeruli, right, between me and my other colleagues, the other colleagues, right, we're good at telling you the percentage of glomeruli that are globally sclerosed, as a percentage, of course, of the other glomeruli. But what are we bad at? We're bad at arteriolar hyalinosis, which can be part of a scoring system, which kind of gives us a good idea about chronicity of, uh, of the kidney disease. We're also really bad at scoring tubular injury. Of course, we're better at these things when we do it by paraffin tissue. But even in paraffin tissue, we're not extremely concordant with each other, right? Now, they didn't just stop there. They also did something very unique to answer the question of what is better, a wedge biopsy or a core biopsy, right? So in a core biopsy, it's a thin thing. I can go from right to left, and I know I'm not going to look at the same area more than once. In a wedge biopsy, I might look at an area more than once. So counting glomeruli, and this is really reflected in their data, is so much easier to do on a core biopsy. And because we're going on a straight line, usually from right to left or from top to bottom, and we're not recounting the same glomeruli in a core biopsy, the correlation between different pathologies is phenomenal. It is less, of course. It's still good, but it's less on the wedge biopsy. Another thing, we're much better at correlating with each other when we score interstitial fibrosis on wedge biopsies versus core biopsies. 
right? So number of glomeruli, it's always better to get a core biopsy, but keep in mind, in a wedge biopsy, we might get a larger number of glomeruli, which means things will even up because we're giving you a percentage, right? If you see the number 300 total glomeruli and about 20, then you get the percentage, right? Versus five on a core out of 50. So you'll always get the percentage. You'll always put things in perspective using that percentage of globally sclerosed glomerulized percentage with the total number of glomeruli. Now with interstitial fibrosis, of course, if you're biopsying these scarred areas, then we'll have a problem, right? <clears throat> so I'm gonna just be very quick here, but I'm gonna say that, you know, at the, you know studies have shown that these biopsies at the hands of experienced kidney pathologists, not your regular overnight, midnight, somewhere at three o'clock in the morning pathologists who are on call, not necessarily, not necessarily trained in, patho in kidney pathology, is going to fulfill your two criteria that you need, which is the producibility as well as prognostic value. Not just the 12-month kidney function, but it can also discriminate between kidneys that did well from those that are not going to well. Okay. Now, there are different types of discordance. I don't think we have enough time to go through them, but sometimes your results may, from the right to the left kidney might be discordant. Maybe the left kidney is more damaged than the right kidney or vice versa, but pay attention to this. You can re-biopsy the worst kidney from a different area that looks healthier. See if that will change the biopsy result before you decide to throw that kidney. Because sometimes you use one kidney and we throw away the other kidney, but both kidneys are coming from the same patient. And maybe we ought to kind of try and re-biopsy these kidneys just to see if the pathology is gonna look different. And maybe we're able to give it to a patient who actually is really sick and really needs really it, right? So I'm gonna leave this out there. I'm gonna start answering your questions because I think we're running out of time. So Laura, how do we how do we get to questions? Thank you so so much. I'll go ahead and just remind everybody you can start putting questions in the Q and A. We've got a few in there, and we we will definitely have Dr. Alhag on again. I, I just I actually quickly had a question for you. Didn't you pre present it Bamf recently? And I think you're a little in the most recent one. I think you were a presenter at that yes, time, right? Yes, yes, I was an attendant. So yeah, I, you're always a little humble about it, so I just wanted to let everybody yes, know, yeah. which is a really fascinating conference that you go to. So so one of our first questions, uh, Genevieve Springer, she says, what do you believe is the biggest barrier to better utilization? Question think, of the hour. I think we have a lot of OBOs. I think which is a good thing, by the way, because the U.S. is a huge country, right? I think we utilize a lot more organs than our European counterparts. And I think we were very good at it, but we're not as efficient. I think efficiency needs to improve. We need to be able to utilize a lot more organs. I think, one, we need to expand the donor pool, right? We need to convince as many people as possible to become organ donors. Right? Because then we can have the luxury of saying, hey, this is a really bad kidney. This is a really bad liver. We cannot use it. Right? Two, I think practices are different from one transplant center to the next transplant center, from one transplant zone or OPO to another, from one onus region to another. I think these are not uniform. It's very hard to make practices uniform for so many reasons. Big transplantation centers, for example, can be more willing to take risk and accept borderline organs. Whereas, because they can, you know, they can, they can, their numbers don't look bad because they have a huge number of patients that they transplant. If a couple fail because they just took the risk and took a, a less than ideal organ, their numbers are not going to look worse. But when you have a center that transplants 20 to 30, if five of them, didn't do well, or the one year post transplant follow up didn't do well, then their numbers are going to be much, much miserable, right? So there are centers that are willing to take the risk, they're willing to expand the donor pool, they're willing to take more HCV mismatch, they're willing to try out COVID donors, they're willing to do all of this. While other centers maybe are not as willing to do these because one, they want the reputation to be better. They don't want to be dinged by OPTN and UNOS for having a less than ideal results because they you know, may have accepted an organ that didn't do well at the one-year mark. So I think that's a barrier that we can have further discussions on really how to draw these lines and kind of allow people to say, you know what, I think this is a marginal donor. I want to take it. I think I have a patient that I can help out with this organ. Okay. So that's, I think, one thing. The other thing is, again, with 
donors being all around the place in Alaska, in Wyoming, in Montana, in Cleveland, in, in Pittsburgh, in DC, in LA. Usually we rely a lot on these hospitals to provide us services for frozen section, kind of help us allocate these organs. Now, each different pathologist looks at it, a different clinician looks at it. It's not centralized, meaning the discrepancy, or I wouldn't call it discrepancy, but the inter the observations are going to be discrepant or they're going to be discordant, meaning they're not going to be transplantable. They're not reproducible, meaning one, one clinician, one pathologist and a clinician pair will look at it and say, this is a horrible organ. Then we'll go somewhere else and they say, this is a, this is a good organ. I think there is an example. This is liver, not kidney. We got a local read of about 60 or 70% steatosis. Do you remember, Laura? It was a high read mysteriosis, which makes yeah. it a really bad organ. Nobody would want to transplant this organ. Clinician called us. We looked at it. We said, no, this is at max 15% steatosis. Now, and that correlated with the clinician said, because the clinician said, this organ doesn't really look bad. It's just a different age group, extended criteria. I wanted to make sure that there is no huge red flags, but we got this read, which doesn't really correlate with what we're seeing. So yes, I can share the paper from Spain. Let's go back. Oh, here, yeah. Let's let's actually yeah. let's do this one. So so this one's from Nicholas Onaka. This is a, a, a very clinical. How do we manage arterial sclerosis? He says he feels it's underread and frozen, and even looking at the frozen, he often reads more of it than the pathologist. What is moderate on your slide looks more severe to me, based on the ratio of open lumen versus total. Remember, again, that's a very good question. I, I do absolutely believe that. So, Laura, please go back at some point and, and give them that the reference to that. There's a number of papers that were kind of, I think, cited in this, and I'll give you the most recent ones. Okay. But again, to answer that question, that's a very good question. I absolutely do agree that arteriovascular sclerosis or arterial sclerosis, as well as arteriolar actually arteriolar hyalinosis is a worse problem here, right? But I do truly believe that it, they're both and they're represented. Not everybody reads them. Not everybody's going to give you the, the results, a correct result on arteriosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. Again, there are parameters. I mean, here, BAMF, and I'll show you the BAMF paper, which kind of, let's go back, which kind of kind of lays out exactly what these are and how they're evaluated. Mm -hmm. But remember, again, most we, we evaluate at the worst artery, and we talk about arterial intimal sclerosis, less than 25%, between 26 to 25% of the lumen. You have to remember that these arteries are not always cut flush, meaning they're not cut perfectly. They're always cut at an angle. It's very hard to get an artery that was cut 100% the right way, right? It's just not going to happen because of how this tissue is and how the, the anatomy looks like and how histology looks like. So we have to kind of compensate for that tangential section sometimes. So what might look severe if you apply things without the knowledge that the angle affects the amount of arteriosclerosis, that can be a problem. And that is actually one of the big difficulties in assessing arteriosclerosis. I hope that answers the question. Because what might be mild to me might be moderate to somebody else, and what might be moderate to somebody else might be mild to somebody. You know what I mean? There is a little bit of variability, but most of the time we're very good at detecting severe disease as well as mild disease. That moderate can always become a problem. But to me here, given how this, for example, on this side is less, but is more on this side, I know it wasn't cut perfectly. So for me, more than 50% of the lumen is not involved by disease. So for me, this is moderate. Okay, I'm gonna get one more quick question in. And again, everyone, if you have more questions, you can keep submitting them to us and also on the survey and we will definitely Definitely be having more of these with Dr. Hag. We, we can't thank you enough for your time on this, Dr. Hag. So one other really quick question is: I, I believe you kind of answered this. Was how do you believe the current ecosystem makes the job of transplant surgeons possibly harder than it needs to be? You know, I think there is a lot of demand on organs. There is a lot of attention to the number of discarded organs. There is, again, there is that emphasis on results that we have to deliver always. Mm -hmm. And I think if some of those burdens are lessened on, on transplant centers, they would be more, maybe more willing to maybe, you know, of course, with the consent of the patients, maybe a little bit riskier. Of course, you know, there is 
other issues that include logistics, transportation, differences from one setting to the other, as well as the availability of ORs. And that's why I have been a huge proponent of donor care units, because that gives you, guarantees you your OR time. You don't have to go in when the hospital says you can go in. Right. And I think that has been a huge goal, and that has been a big reason and a good reason to have donor care units, for example. Uh, I think these are just some of the few challenges that they share. I'm not a transplant surgeon, but I think these are some of the challenges that they, you know, speaking to them, these are some of the challenges that they have related to. Well, great. I wanted to be respectful of everyone's time at this point, and there are some other questions, and we'll see what we can do to get you on again and get some of these answered. And Nicholas, maybe I saw yours. Maybe we can have you get on a call with Dr. Alhag directly with you and your group. Anyway, we thank you so much, everyone, for participating in this. Again, if you wouldn't mind taking a little bit of the time to fill out the survey. And not only do we just love this, that you took the time to do this, Dr. Alhag, we Human loves working with you. The coordinators that get the opportunity to work with you, you've just, you've really, you and, you know, the peer group of the pathologists that we have have raised the bar on what services we feel we can provide to the OPO community in, the, in transplantation pathology. So, so thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. And again, thank you so much for the help for you and for Steve and for the team for kind of help put this together. Happy to answer questions anytime. Anybody has them, you can feel free to share my email address with them. And thank you again for attending us. I appreciate Great. it. Thank you no so much. Opportunity to be here with you.